Hello and welcome to a short biography on Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. A few terms that you may find useful can be found in the description box below. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi came into the world on October 2, 1869, in the coastal town Porbandar, which was at that time part of British India. His father was Karamchand Gandhi, who served as a Daiwan, or high official of Porbandar state. His mother, Putlubai, was Karamchand's fourth wife, the previous three wives dying while in, while in childbirth. She was a devout woman. Gandhi also grew up in the traditions of Jainism, which were prevalent in the region. These influences would play an important role in his adult life, including compassion for sentient beings, fasting, vegetarianism, and a high level of tolerance for other social customs and ways of life. Indian classics, such as Shravana, greatly impacted the young Gandhi, who identified values such as truth and love as supreme. According to customs of the region at the time, a 13-year-old Gandhi married Katsurbai Makanji, one year his senior, in May of 1883 in an arranged marriage. Recalling the day of his marriage, he once said, As we didn't know much about marriage, for us it meant only wearing new clothes, eating sweets, and playing with relatives. At the age of 15, Gandhi and his wife had their first child, but only survived a few days. Together they would have four more children, all sons, Hiralal, 1888, Manilal, 1892, Ramdas, 1897, and Devdas, 1900. As far as his schooling went, Gandhi was an average student, passing the matriculation exam for Simaldis College with difficulty. While in college, he was unhappy in part because his family wanted him to become a barrister or lawyer. On September 4, 1888, the year his first son was born, Gandhi traveled to London, England to study law at University College, London. There he studied Indian law and jurisprudence, which was training for him to become a barrister at the Inner Temple. His time in England was tempered by a vow he had made before leaving to his mother in the presence of the Jain monk Bekarajai. He vowed to observe Hindu law of abstinence from consuming meat or alcohol and against promiscuity. His vegetarianism would prove difficult for Gandhi in England, finding the food offered to him by his landlady to be bland, and he was chronically hungry as a result, until he found one of the few vegetarian restaurants in London. Soon enough, he was a member of the Vegetarian Society and elected to its executive committee, starting a local Bayswater chapter. The contacts he made would prove to be influential on him. Gandhi hadn't been interested in religion previously, but his contacts encouraged him to learn more, which he did, studying Hindu, Muslim, and Christian doctrine. On the 10th of June in 1891, Gandhi was called to the bar. Two days later, he left London bound for India, where he learned that his mother died, news that his family had kept from him. He attempted to start a law practice in Bombay, which failed. After that, he applied for a part-time job as a high school teacher, which was turned down. Gandhi then returned to Rajkot, making a modest living drafting petitions for litigants. This, too, ended when he ran afoul of a British officer. After this, he accepted a year-long contract with Data Abdullah and Company, an Indian firm, to a post in the colony of Natal in South Africa, which was then a part of the British Empire. His journey from India to South Africa would open the young Gandhi's eyes to the discrimination he, as an Indian, would face. He was thrown off a train after refusing to move to a third-class coach from first class, despite having a valid first class ticket. Further along, he was beaten by a stagecoach driver for failing to make room for a European passenger. 
Gandhi was also barred from several hotels en route to the South African colony and was ordered by a Durban co court to remove his turban, which he refused to do. These events were a turning point in Gandhi's life. After witnessing and experiencing racism, prejudice, and injustice against Indians in South Africa, he began to question his place in British society, and more importantly, his people's place in the British Empire. These events both awoken him to the social injustice and shaped his social activism. Towards the end of his contract in South Africa, a bill was written which denied Indians there the right to vote. Gandhi decided to remain to assist Indians in opposing the bill, which was passed nevertheless. His campaign, however, proved to be fortunate in that it raised awareness to the grievances Indians made in South Africa. In 1894, Gandhi helped found the Natal Indian Congress, and it was through this organization that he molded the Indian community into a unified political force. Gandhi showed his amazingly principled life in true form in January of 1897, when he was attacked by a mob of white settlers, escaping only with the help of the police superintendent's wife. He refused to press charges against any member of the mob, claiming it was one of his values not to seek redress in a court of law for a personal wrong. A new Transvaal Government Act requiring the colony's Indians to register in 1906 resulted in a mass protest meeting in Johannesburg on September the 11th. It was at this meeting that Gandhi began to form his methodology of Satyagraha or devotion to the truth and practice of nonviolent protest for the first time. He urged the Indian community to defy the new law and accept whatever punishment arose for doing so. His plan was adopted and practiced. In the struggle that would last for seven years, thousands of Indians were jailed, flogged, and even executed for refusing to register. The British government succeeded in repressing the protest but the outcry against such violence directed against the peaceful Indians forced the South African general, Jan Christian Smets, to negotiate with Gandhi. The social and racial divides at this time, the early 20th century, found Gandhi writing articles which today we would consider racist. He was keen to note the differences between the three major groups in South Africa at the time, the native Africans, the British, and the Indians. Of the Africans, Gandhi wrote, Kaffirs are as a rule uncivilized, the convicts even more so. They are troublesome, very dirty, and live almost like animals. The term Kaffir was a neutral word for a black person. Gandhi had been introduced and influenced by notions of segregation prevalent in the 1890s, views he would later come to reject. Two British officers were killed by Zulus in 1906 in response to a new poll tax in South Africa. In response, the British declared war against the Zulu Kingdom. Gandhi saw this conflict as a means for Indians to be socially equal to the British. He called on his fellow Indians to participate in the war, thinking that such support for the British would legitimize their claims to full citizenship. The British refused to commission Indians as army officers, though they did accept Gandhi's offer to lead a medical detachment in support of the British. Gandhi's shifting of social views could be seen clearly at this time. Though seeking social equality with the British, he could not help but acknowledge the methods of fighting social inequality he saw in the native Africans, who he thought at that time as inferior. In his own words, even the half-castes and Kaffirs, who are less advanced than we, have resisted the government. The pass law applies to them as well, but they do not take out the passes. In 1927, Gandhi wrote of the event, The Boer War had not brought home to me the horrors of war with anything like the vividness that the Zulu Rebellion did. This was no war, but a manhunt 
not only in my opinion, but also in that of many Englishmen with whom I had occasion to talk. Gandhi returned to India from South Africa in 1915. He spoke at the Indian National Congress conventions on his previous experiences, but it was through Gopal Krishna Gokhal, a respected leader of the Congress party at the time, that Gandhi was introduced to Indian issues. Towards the end of World War I, in April of 1918, Gandhi was invited by the British Viceroy in India to a war conference in Delhi. Even at this time, Gandhi was still actively supporting the British, trying to build relations by recruiting Indians to serve in the war. And, in contrast to his recruitment efforts in South Africa during the Zulu War, he actively sought individuals who would serve as combatants, not just medics. In a leaflet entitled, Appeal for Enlistment, Gandhi wrote, To bring about such a state of things, we should have the ability to defend ourselves, that is, the ability to bear arms and to use them. If we want to learn the use of arms with the greatest possible dispatch, it is our duty to enlist ourselves in the army. Gandhi did, however, make it known that he personally would not kill or injure anyone, friend or foe alike. Gandhi's war recruitment campaign brought into question his consistency on nonviolence, at least up to this point in his life. His friend Charlie Andrews said on the subject, Personally, I have never been able to reconcile this with his own conduct in other respects, and it is one of the points where I have found myself in painful disagreement. Gandhi's private secretary admitted that, the question of the consistency between his creed of ahimsa, or nonviolence, and his recruiting campaign was raised not only then, but has been discussed ever since. Sometime in 1918, the last year of World War I, Gandhi's focus began to shift away from appeasement to, and collaboration with, the British government. The first Satyagraha revolutions within the larger Indian independence movement, movement began in 1918 and led by Gandhi. The Indian citizens were being mistreated by the British, a practice that had been observed for many years. However, by 1918, the British were treating the Indians as second-class citizens in their own country. The vast majority of Indians within the British Raj, or British rule over India, were poor farmers who survived by subsisting on their own farms. In order to fund the First World War, the British landlords effectively confiscated the Indian people's food crops, paying them very little in return. In other regions, the British forced the Indian peasants to grow cr cash crops such as indigo instead of food crops needed for them to survive. With little or nothing to show for their labor, poverty became commonplace and their villages were kept unsanitary and filthy. Alcoholism became rampant as well. With the Indian people now facing extreme famine, the British did what any empire would do to address the problem. They levied a new tax on the Indian people. By this time the problem was truly desperate. The town and municipality of Kedda would be the epicenter of Gandhi's activism during these times. He built an ashram there, organizing with many veteran followers and fresh volunteers from the region. Together they made detailed studies of the villages, accounting for atrocities and suffering, as well as the squalor many Indians lived in. Gandhi then led a massive movement to clean up the villages and the building of hospitals and schools. He also worked with community leaders to condemn and undo social ills such as alcoholism and untouchability. Due to Gandhi's prominence in these movements, he was singled out and arrested by the British government, charged with creating unrest and ordered to leave the province. Hundreds of thousands of Indians rallied to Gandhi, protesting in front of the jail he was in, police stations and courts. The people demanded Gandhi be released, which was reluctantly granted. Immediately after he was freed, Gandhi led mass protest against the landowners who agreed, with guidance from the British, 
to suspend taxes on the farmers until the famine ended. Furthermore, the landowners increased compensation for labor and granted the people control over farming in general. It was during these movements that Gandhi was first called Mahatma, or Great Soul. As a result of his efforts, Gandhi became a well-known figure throughout all of India. On the 13th of April, 1919, in the public garden of Jallianwala Bagh, between 400 and 1,000 Indian citizens were massacred by British troops led by Brigadier General Reginald E. H. Dyer. Occurring during a religious festival, 50 British soldiers arrived at the public garden and began to shoot into a crowd of unarmed Indians without warning, with women and children present. The soldiers fired into the crowd until everyone was either dead or had escaped. This massacre caused severe distress to the Indian people which led to rioting and violence committed by Indians against the British Raj. Gandhi condemned the violent retaliation of the Indians against the British, authoring a resolution which offered condolences to the British civilians who were the victims of Indian violence. In an emotional speech made by Gandhi, he called for all Indians to practice non-violence at all times stating that all violence is evil and could not be justified. After the massacre and subsequent violence, Gandhi began to focus on reclaiming all of India from the British Raj, seeking self-government, which soon matured into the concept of Swaraj, or self-rule. His advocation of complete individual, spiritual, and political independence applied both to the people as a community as well as for the individual. December 1921 saw the beginning of what would be a major transformative movement in India. The Indian National Congress invested executive authority to Mohandas Gandhi. He used his newfound powers to reorganize the Congress with a new constitution with Swaraj as the goal. Anyone could join the party with a nominal token fee. Gandhi also focused the various committees away from elite hierarchies and their concerns to that of the people and the nation of India. Throughout this period and for the remainder of his life, Mahatma Gandhi practiced and advocated for total nonviolence, with no exceptions. He also called for a general boycott against foreign, mainly British, goods and services. Brit British schools, courts, and other institutions were boycotted throughout the country as Indians began to resign from public offices. Gandhi also called for all Indians to reject their British titles and honors. Another policy advocated by Gandhi was for all Indians, rich and poor, men and women, to spend a certain amount of time every day spinning and making their own clothing, with the goal of eliminating British textiles from the Indian market. Gandhi even went so far as to invent a small portable spinning wheel that could be folded into a box the size of a small suitcase so he could make clothes for himself wherever he went. Gandhi traveled about at this time and one of his trips took him to the region of Orissa. While speaking about Swaraj, an old woman forced her way to meet Gandhi. There she knelt before him, touched his feet, and placed a one-piece paisa copper coin before him. Gandhi remarked later on the occasion, The coin was perhaps all that the poor woman possessed. She gave me all she had. That was very generous of her. What a great sacrifice she made. That is why I value this copper coin more than a crore of rupees. The non-cooperation movement was enjoying widespread popularity and success, energizing the Indian people in all strata of society. This changed in early February 1922. In the town of Chuari Chuara, movement members called for fair prices for meat in the marketplace. The demonstrators were beaten back by the local police. In response, 
a mob of about 2,000 protesters gathered and began to march towards the police line. After firing warning shots in the air, and which had no effect on the group, an order was given to fire into the crowd. Three were killed and several more were wounded. In response to this, the Indians continued to march on the police who eventually fell back to their police station. At this point, members of the demonstration set the police station on fire, which burned the 23 officers trapped inside to death. Gandhi reacted to the violence with a five-day fast as penance and even went so far as to call off the entire movement, fearing the movement could lead to further violence. The speed at which power was restored to the British left thousands of supporters in the lurch and who were jailed. Gandhi himself was arrested on March 10, 1922, tried for sedition and sentenced to six years in prison. He served two years and was released after suffering an appendicitis. The time Gandhi spent in prison allowed for the splintering of the once unified Congress into two main factions. Cooperation between Hindus and Muslims began to break down as well, who had had a strong bond against the common enemy at the height of success, but without Gandhi's direct contact with the various leaders of the movement, those bonds began to weaken. Gandhi remained outside of active politics throughout much of the 1920s, though he still supported and encouraged his fellow Indians to work against problems such as untouchability, poverty, and ignorance. He also spent a lot of time convincing the Indian National Congress that the idea of Swaraj was the only acceptable path of Indian autonomy. In 1927, the British government appointed Sir John Simon to head a new constitutional reform commission, which did not have any Indians as members. This resulted in a boycott against the commission by Indian political parties. In December of 1928, Gandhi returned to the public sphere. He pushed through a resolution at the Calcutta Congress calling for the British government to accept India Dominion status or else they would face another non-cooperation movement with complete independence for the Indian people as the goal. The British officials offered no response. The flag of India was unfurled in Lahore on the 31st of December 1929. On the 26th of January, 1930, the Indian National Congress celebrated India's Independence Day, which was also observed by almost every other Indian organization as well. Two months later, Gandhi launched a new Satyagraha against the tax on salt. This movement was highlighted by Gandhi's famous Salt March, during which he marched with thousands of followers from the Sabarmati ashram to Dandai, which was a 388 kilometer or 241 mile walk. Although it was one of the most successful movements in the move towards liberation, the British nonetheless imprisoned over 60,000 Indian citizens as a result. In March of 1931, the British government's representative, Lord Edward Irwin, negotiated with Gandhi, which resulted in the Gandhi-Irwin Pact. This agreement liberated all Indian political prisoners on the condition that the civil disobedience movement be suspended. Gandhi was also invited to attend the Roundtable Conference in London as a result of the pact. He was the sole representative for the Indian National Congress. This meeting was disappointing for Gandhi, who wished to discuss a transfer of power in India but instead deliberated on Indian princes and minorities. Moreover, the successor to Lord Irwin, Lord Willingdon, began a new campaign to suppress the nationalist movement. Gandhi was again arrested and removed from the public sphere, a tactic made by the British to negate his influence with the people. The tactic did not work. Under the new constitution, the government granted untouchables separate electorates through campaigning by B. R. Ambedkar, 
who himself was born an untouchable and then prominent leader of the Dalit community. Dalit being another name for untouchable. Gandhi himself was not a Dalit, but rather born into the Vaishya caste category, which include farmers, traders, bankers, and artisans. In response, Gandhi went on a six-day fast, which resulted in a public outcry, which in turn forced the government to adopt a more equitable arrangement. This began a new campaign by Gandhi to end the discrimination prevalent then against Dalits, and to improve their lives. He even named the Dalit people Harijans, the children of God. Along with these reproaches, Amdekar also criticized Gandhi for his refusal to support the Dalit community in 1924 and 1925 during their campaign for the right to pray in temples. Because of this, Amdekar described Gandhi as devious and untrustworthy. Gandhi resigned from party membership when the Congress party chose to contest elections and accepted power under the Federation scheme. He didn't want to stifle the party's membership, which was varied and included communists, socialists, trade unionists, students, and others, with his popularity with the Indian people as a whole. Perhaps the main reason he resigned from the party was due to its collaboration with the British Raj, which Gandhi saw by this time as an institution he wanted no part of, and to avoid the propaganda which was sure to follow, promoting the idea that Gandhi actually favored the Raj. With the Nehru presidency and the Lucknow Congress in session, Gandhi returned to active politics in 1936. The new government officials discoursed mostly on the future of India, although Gandhi wanted to focus on winning independence. The Congress adopted socialism as its goal, with no restraint from Gandhi. With the presidency of Subhas Bose in 1938, he and Gandhi quarreled over Satyagraha, with Bose uncertain of total nonviolence as being effective, and the president also had reservations about democracy. Despite criticism from Gandhi, Bose won a second term. However, he left the Congress when the All India leaders protested against his abandonment of the principles introduced by Gandhi, which resulted in an en masse resignation. On the 1st of September 1939, the German military invaded Poland, precipitating World War II. As the British was becoming more and more involved in the war, and the war itself becoming a truly global struggle, the Indian nation under the Raj became embroiled in the war as well. Initially, Gandhi favored offering the British government nonviolent moral support, but other congressional leaders voiced their strong protest, pointing out that the decision to go to war was made without the Indian people's representatives approval. This was the primary reason why all congressmen resigned from office. After long deliberations, Gandhi concluded and declared that India could not support the British in their goal to maintain British democratic liberty while the same liberties were denied to the Indian people. As World War II progressed, Gandhi increased his demand for independence. In what would be the most important revolt aimed at securing the British exit from India, Gandhi drafted a resolution called the Quit India Campaign, also called the August Movement. This was a civil disobedience campaign launched in August 1942. The Quit India Campaign would become the most significant movement of the entire cause for Indian independence, with mass arrests and violence on an unprecedented scale. Thousands of freedom fighters were killed or injured by police violence, and hundreds of thousands were imprisoned. Gandhi made it clear that even if there were episodes of counter-violence by individuals, the Quit India campaign itself would not stop. While Gandhi was held in high regard amongst the Indian people, he nevertheless received criticism on his stance against participation in the war, with some pro-British groups claiming it unethical 
to refrain from stopping Nazi Germany. Meanwhile, he also received criticism from anti-British groups who claimed that the Quit India campaign should take more action against the British Raj. On August 9, 1942, Gandhi and the entire Congress Working Committee were arrested in Bombay by British officials. Gandhi would be held for two years in the Aga Khan Palace located in Pune. In prison, Gandhi suffered three private misfortunes. His 50-year-old secretary, Mahadev Desai, died of a heart attack. His wife, Kasturbai, died after he was imprisoned for 18 months. And six weeks later, Gandhi contracted malaria. On the sixth day of May, 1944, Gandhi was released for two reasons. The malaria he contracted was severe, so for health reasons he was freed. And for political reasons, in that the British Raj didn't want Gandhi to die in prison, which would almost certainly have erupted into anarchy. Gandhi's release from prison revealed a different political landscape from when he went in. As an example, the Muslim League was a marginal group in 1942 but by 1944 was at the center of the political stage. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader of the Muslim League, met with Gandhi in Bombay in September 1944. Jinnah, who would go on to found the Pakistan nation, disagreed with Gandhi on the grounds that it fell short of a fully independent Pakistan. The Quit India movement saw moderate success, although the ruthless suppression by the British brought order to India by the end of 1943. Towards the end of World War II, British officials gave clear indications that power in India would be transferred to Indian hands. At this point, Gandhi called off the movement, followed by the release of about 100,000 political prisoners, including the Congress's leadership. There was a source of contention between the Muslim League and the Indian National Congress on how to proceed. Jinnah and the Muslim League thought the best course of action was to partition the regions with Muslim majorities, establish new boundaries, and then work on liberation from the British. Meanwhile, Gandhi and the Indian National Congress sought to achieve independence first, and then, under a provisional government, to resolve the question of partition. On the 16th of August, 1946, Jinnah called for a direct action also known as the Great Calcutta Killings. The day also marked the beginning of what is known as the Week of the Long Knives. It was a day of widespread rioting in the city of Calcutta, which also involved violence and murder. Gandhi personally visited the most turbulent areas to stop the massacres. During this week and afterwards, he sought to unite Hindus, Muslims, and Christians in a collective struggle for independence as well as emancipating the Dalits in Hindu society. The Indian Independence Act was invoked on the 14th and 15th of August, 1947. The carnage that followed would claim about 1 million lives and displace up to 12 million more. It must be noted, however, that without the guidance and teachings of Gandhi and the efforts of his followers, the loss of life would have almost certainly been much higher. While walking to a platform from which he was to address a prayer meeting, Mohandas Gandhi was fatally shot at point-blank range three times with a 38 caliber Beretta semi-automatic pistol. The date was January 30th, 1948. Here are a few quotes by Mohandas Gandhi. Victory attained by violence is tantamount to a defeat, for it is momentary. Nonviolence is the first article of my faith. It is also the last article of my creed. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. I worship God as truth only. I have not yet found him, but I am seeking after him. 
and unjust law is itself a species of violence.